Hey, welcome everyone to our Sing Ray webinar of the month. We are talking black and white photography tonight with Jennifer King. She is an internationally acclaimed award-winning landscape and fine art photographer with a passion for teaching and inspiring photographers. She draws on her fine art and design background to bring an artistic perspective to nature photography. Her, fine, her photography, video tutorials and interviews and in Shutter Magazine, Outdoor Photographer, Wild Planet, Camera in the Wild, Smoky Mountains, Journal of Photography, Our State Magazine, F-Stop Collaborate, and many, many more. She also speaks at many yearly photography summits and promotes continued photography education through books, tutorials, webinars, and videos. She was actually named one of 15 women to follow by 500 pixels. And she has, um, we invite you just to check out her website and see her long list of credentials. Um, Jennifer, with that, I will hand it over to you and let you get going. Thanks so much, Michelle. Hello, everybody. And thank you for coming over tonight to join me in the art of black and white photography. Great. Now, there's something quite magical about black and white photography, um, the silver light component that creates a sense of illusion, the dark tones that produce an emotional response, and the light that brings each image to life. From the many genres of art throughout history, there is one form of art that remains as powerful today as when it first started, and that is the art of photography. Since the creation of the photographic process, the art of photography has been rendered through time by many photographers in very different ways, always translating the changes in our world, capturing our lives, and enriching our vision. What makes black and white photography so appealing to so many photographers? To me, it's the drama of the dark tones, the mystery that it creates, and the feeling that it is more than just a photo, it's a piece of art. I consider black and white photography to be fine art photography and not because color loses anything in translation, but because working in black and white allows us to simply deviate from the norm to create something both behind the lens and in processing that is different than what our eyes see. It's a way of viewing our subject, in my case, nature, with the intent to create something different than how it appears to most people. One of the most important things to realize about black and white photography is that it can translate into a form of fine art. And it's different from color landscape photography, which focuses on realism and what you see through your lens. Black and white photography is a departure from reality. It is an illusion because most of us see in color. So how do we learn to transition from our nature and landscape photography to a fine art approach? Learning to become a fine art photographer is easier than it sounds. Pablo Picasso once said that every child is an artist and the problem is to remain an artist once they grow up. Humans are creative by nature. So how do we find our inner artist after we become distracted adults? Well, we use our senses instead of our minds. This is my niece, my beautiful niece, Naomi. And when I watch her play, she is in her own little world. She has imaginary friends, little tea parties. We've lost that as we've gotten older. And it's so refreshing and so charming to see this, uh, this play alive in our children, all this creativity. 
you know, sight, sound, and touch, our physical senses that can help us connect to our subject. But there are more than just our physical senses. There are cognitive senses like feelings and emotions. And I know it, it's our feelings and our emotions and our reactions that help us to connect to pretty much everything in life. So why not use them to connect to nature and photography? Let's break down our senses even more. We have happiness, fear, uh, peacefulness, and anxiety. Now let's mix one of those with our standard senses, like sound, for instance. When I'm out photographing on the sand dunes, I'm listening to music. So if you ever hear Pink Floyd at dawn on the dunes, come over and say hello. Um, I don't know why my reaction to this music is so strong, but it does put me in the state of mind to where I contemplate many things in life. And that music inspired cognitive reaction helps me to reflect about people that have come and gone in my life, uh, the places I've lived over the years, and the memories that come with this reflection of time. Now, we all go through periods in our lives when our emotions are more prominent in our daily lives for a multitude of reasons. In March 2020, when the world began to shut down, I had Death Valley National Park pretty much to myself. And while I was photographing, I was able to tap into my fear and I put that emotion into my work. And what I learned in that short period of time is that there is a difference between converting an image to black and white and creating a black and white photo. That's when my approach to photography changed. From that time forward, my focus turned to placing myself in the moment, incorporating my senses, emotions, and my vision into the landscape I was photographing. So how can we do this? Well, a great way to tap into emotions is to practice some basic visualization techniques. For example, say you plan to photograph the Oregon coast. Well, before you leave home, spend 15 or 20 minutes searching for photos of the area that you're traveling to to help you achieve some sort of visual stimulation. You know, what kind of photos did you react to? Are they long exposures of water? Maybe you are drawn to the reflections in the sand. Make a mental note of what triggered a visual response and make that your target subject. We normally don't think of black and white photography as having a high dynamic range, but it does. There are 256 shades of gray in your image, and you will need to choose which of these shades or tones you want to emphasize. Contrast is a great tool for black and white photography. In fact, I choose to photograph in high contrast, middle of the day, um, because I personally like the darker tones and the brighter whites. Creating fine art through photography is not so much about what you photograph and more about how you photograph. And visualization plays an important role. I encourage you to practice basic techniques to help you approach photography in a new or just different kind of way, like approach it with meditation or take a couple of deep breaths so you can relax when you get to your spot. You know, fine tuning your creative side is not a race to the finish line and you are not racing against the sun. When you arrive at your destination, try closing your eyes and imagine the photo. Now that you have that mental image of what you want to achieve, it's time to put yourself into the image. Think of someone important to you or a special memory. And if you are thinking about work, stop. 
take a couple more deep breaths and try again. If you're questioning your settings, stop. You will figure this out in time. These moments of relaxing or letting go may feel like you're out of control, but you are not. You are simply exploring how to express yourself through your photography and on your way to achieving, achieving new ways to grow as an artist. When I approach my subject, my intention is to create an image that invokes an emotional response. I want you, the viewer, to feel as though you have stepped into the scene and experienced the drama and the power of that moment. My black and white images are designed so the viewer reacts to the light, the shadow, and the shapes. To do this, I approach my black and white photography differently than I do my landscape photography. I go with the intention to photograph in black and white. So in other words, my landscape sessions and my black and white sessions are separate field sessions. This puts me in the mindset to view the landscape not by color or clouds or foreground, but instead I look for the highlights. And once I find the highlights, I can choose the lens and my position with the camera to that light and capture the drama of that moment. The best advice I can give any photographer who is exploring black and white photography and their inner artist is to just slow down. Take your time to visually explore the light. I begin my photo sessions looking with my eyes first instead of through the lens. What is the light touching? Does it make an interesting shape or enhance a part of the subject itself? Then I consider which lens may work best to accomplish what I'm actually seeing with my eyes. And once you begin to photograph by the light and not by the landscape, you begin to see landscape differently. Look for light and shadow and you will find drama. Remember, fine art is not based in realism and neither is black and white photography. So allow yourself to get creative with what you are doing. Change the look and the appearance from what you see with your eyes to what you envision. Remember those images you found during your research that you reacted to? Think about those for a moment. See if you can creatively translate that earlier reaction into what is in front of you right now. Then simply put yourself and your mood into that moment when you're photographing. I mean, do you feel happy, sad, maybe intense? You tune in with all that is going on around you. When I'm on the sand dunes or in Iceland and I'm photographing, I mean, I, I think about everything in my environment. Is the air cool? Uh, can you feel the sun on your face? Can you hear the wind? Artists have used emotions and senses throughout history as a part of their creative process, allowing yourself to connect, to open up, and to react will truly help you find that inner artist that is inside of you, whether you believe it is or not. You just have to try. The same basic design principles used for landscape photography apply in black and white. And it's important to study and apply the art of composition, as this will always be the foundation of your photography. For creating black and white images, there are some key design elements that will help you bring your image to life. The use of foreground details, which is so crucial for communicating dimension, can be quite powerful in black and white. Having a strong foreground, middle ground, and background creates depth 
and increases the vastness in any landscape and foreground adds drama to your image. The best way to enhance your foreground is to get low or close to the forest foreground subject. This allows you to play with spatial relationships by exaggerating the entrance to your image. And another wonderful thing about a strong foreground is it creates a sense of placement. That's very important to help people connect to your photo. Anytime that you provide something in the foreground, the viewer will feel a sense of connection to your image. Give the viewer a place to step into your landscape and, or something for them to reach out and touch so that they can feel like they're a part of your photo. The use of lines in your images are the most effective way to immediately capture the viewer's attention because your eye will always follow a line. And lines on their own can be one of the strongest structural elements in the visual arts as they draw the viewer in, hold attention, and even on their own, they create striking images. Our eyes are designed to move and lines can give the viewer direction into your photo. Leading lines are very effective if you want to point the viewer into the photo or towards your hero. But even on its own, it can create a very mysterious or abstract feeling to your photography. And from a creative standpoint, images with lines is the dominant element. They're often seen as sensual, dramatic, and they make powerful images on their own, even without any other element in that image. Now, there is little that shows the beauty of nature as well as simplicity. The impact of a simple subject cannot be outweighed artistically by any grandeur or convey a story more powerful than just plain simplicity. Beautiful, beautiful objects, beautiful scenes, beautiful simplicity. It's all in the light. It's in the shapes. It's in the highlights and the shadows. And whether it's a landscape or a detail of nature, the art of simplicity can be extremely powerful in black and white. Some of my favorite images are taken with my 70 to 200 millimeter lens or my one to 400 millimeter. Using a longer lens for landscape or any subject really allows for me to isolate the dramatic light I see and therefore, I can help direct your eye to the light after I capture the, capture the image. Lines, patterns, textures mixed with highlight and shadow are very graphic in nature and translate very well into black and white. I always look for these elements when I'm in the field. So Jennifer, remember, are, uh -huh. you, are you shooting primarily black and white directly or converting from color? That's an excellent question. Every photograph of mine is in raw format. Um, a lot of people that get started, I recommend that they turn a setting on in their, their picture viewer inside their camera and change it from auto or standard to monochrome. This is very beneficial for people who are just getting started because they can actually see behind the camera through the lens what it is translating like in black and white. Now, if you're photographing a JPEG, it will remain black and white. If you're photographing in RAW, once you import it into Lightroom, it is still a RAW file and has all the color information in there. Excellent question. But I do want you to remember that not everything needs to be a grand landscape. I mean, sometimes the light, uh, the line, the simplicity of your scene will communicate more intensity than any complex image could.
We normally don't think of black and white photography as having a high dynamic range, but it does. There are 256 shades of gray in your image, and you as the artist will need to choose which of these shades or tones you want to emphasize. Contrast is a great tool for black and white photography. In fact, I choose to photograph in high contrast light because I personally like the darker tones and the brighter whites. To me, images that are dark or referred to as low key can create an emotional response because darker tones often reflect mood and intensity and often a bit of mystery. But you can also approach it with a high key style and even consider using a minimalistic approach. Bright images and a lot of white are often felt as peaceful and serene. And this can sometimes be achieved in the field by overprocessing, but it can also be created when you're behind the computer. Bright, high tones for your black and white images are often creating a sense of relaxation. And that is something that many artists are attracted to because we react emotionally to most, most subjects. And try and find, try out some infrared photography. I've been working on infrared for about a year now. And part of learning creativity is remembering how to tap into your inner artist. Um, actually just relearning how to play. While we always process our images, even in color, Processing black and white images becomes more of an artistic approach. This is the second part of the process where we can use the tools we want to bring that vision we had behind the lens to life. Always photograph in raw format. This will allow you to capture as many colors possible with the highest amount of color range and depth. Well, why is this important for black and white photography? Well, even though you are processing in black and white, your colors become your tones and tonality will range from black to white to all points of gray. This will become especially important in processing. Always use your filters in the field a polarizer, a GND or ND filter can be every bit as effective in black and white photography as it is for color. Every bit of information you put into your raw file, the smoother the processing and the transitions will be. And always, always watch your histogram. This is extremely important when you're taking the photo and during the processing stage. You don't want to blow out your highlights, right? And we don't want to lose any details in the black. So your histogram is always going to be the best tool for a successful photo. Now, I mentioned a minute ago about turning monochrome on in your camera, but if you are struggling with black and white in the field or you're just getting started, your camera likely has a setting to preview that image in monochrome. While your photo is still taken in raw format, your viewfinder will show you the image in a monochromatic tone or black and white. And this can assist a great deal when you're learning to transition to black and white photography where you're not focusing on the landscape, you're focusing more on the light and the shapes and the drama. Black and white photography is always going to be a two-step process. Capturing the image by using visualization and creativity behind the camera. And next is using the computer to bring that image to life. Now there are many programs and techniques for processing black and white images. Personally, I like to use Adobe Lightroom as they have all the tools needed to get the job done. Lightroom does offer some presets that you can use for processing your images. 
but I have always found that as the artist, self-processing puts more of my ideas and creativity into the final image. Now, finding your style doesn't end behind the camera. Processing is a very important step in the development and growth as an artist. It will help you find and define your style of art. This is something that will develop over time, but you can get started by trying to determine a processing style that you like. To do this, I recommend that you study the presets from Nick Software. It's called Silver Effects Pro. This is a plugin that can be used with Lightroom and it will allow you to view your photo with processing applied in several different styles. If you continue to go through step-by-step step of each one of those presets, looking at one image over time in Silver Effects Pro, you will likely find that you return to a, only a few of those presets in the menu again and again and again. But that means that you are learning what processing styles you like for your own work. However, I really do encourage photographers not to rely on the presets, use them as a learning tool, enhance and learn to improve, improve what you have seen through your own editing and processing. For my black and white photography, I have learned to compose by the light and not so much by the landscape. Let's make a note of things to look for in the field to help you with visualization. What is the light touching? Where are the lights? Where are the whites? Understand that shadow complements highlights. So these contrasty sections of the landscape that we usually try to avoid in landscape photography may produce your most interesting photos. A black color looks black when it's next to white, but not so much when it's next to 80% gray. Find the shot with your eyes first and then set up your camera. Oftentimes we get to our destination, we just jump right in without much patience and we just wanna photograph. But if you take the time to explore with your eyes before you set up your camera, you will learn to find very special little photos in a big landscape that just become so dramatic. So be sure you find that shot. Take the time and breathe. It is not a race to the finish line. We do get excited about photography, of course, but approaching black and white differently than you would approach landscape photography will help you to create stronger fine art images. The artist within. Once you develop your own look, it's important that you own your own look and know that there is no right or wrong when it comes to art. It's your creation. You can choose your own look. Getting in touch with your inner artist, it takes time and it takes practice. It takes separating yourself from everything that you know as normal photography and allowing yourself to go a different way. The more genres and styles of photography that you practice, the more you're going to learn about yourself and your artistic style. This will apply to all of your photography going forward. Black and white is full of drama, mystery, inspiration, and the best images will always come from within. Photography is a journey. Enjoy the adventure.
All right. I've been holding on to some questions because honestly, I have been loving this sort of inspirational storytelling journey that you've been taking us on and I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> um, so we have a few questions I've been holding on to. Gary mm -hmm. wanted to know, he said, tell me a little more about using a four stop soft ND plus a five stop more slow. Is this to hold back light and make a longer shutter speed giving like drifting clouds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I use my ND filters. I have a five stop and a, a 10 stop neutral density filter. That's a circular solid dark filter that I put on my lens when I want to do long exposure photography. Sometimes I use it to get long exposures or lines in water. Sometimes I use it when clouds are moving towards me um, and I can get that really nice effect. But also at times the sky is brighter than the foreground, which is why I always use a graduated neutral density filter, three or four stop, depending on the light, that helps me balance that brightness in the sky. I know that Lightroom has a, a tool, a linear gradient for that, but it doesn't replace using a filter in the field. That's very important to understand because the more information you put in your raw file, the smoother that transition is always going to be. I always use my graduated filters for sunrises and sunsets. And sometimes I do have to stack those filters to get the result. I think understanding what filter does some, you know, which filter does what for your photography is very important. And the more you play with filters and photography, the more you understand that having those tools in your bag is one of the biggest advantages that you can have in creating artwork. I have so many filters, but they are in my bag all the time. So that's an excellent question. And then is monochrome the same as black and white? Monochrome is basically one color. So you could, Describe monochrome as black and white or sepia. Remember the old sepia tone photographs? That's also monochrome. It's really relying on tonality. So you could have monochrome in any color if you wanted to have a range of 100% blue down to 1% blue, basically, and it would still be monochrome, just like black and white, just the color would be different. When you are capturing an image, you want to be darker mm -hmm. um, to meter for that or shoot to the right and then darken in post-processing? Yeah, I do play around a lot with my metering. Um, so I do spot metering. And th from there, a lot of what I have to do for my black and white is a little bit different than what I'm doing for other photography that I do, like landscape and nature. Um, I will determine, say, let's take this waterfall that's on this shot right here. So this is one of the waterfalls in Iceland. And I really wanted to capture the smoothness of the water and create that sense of darkness around it. So I, I had to meter for the white because I didn't want it to blow out. I needed enough structure. So I was underexposing for this. But a lot of times I have to play around a good bit. I want the water to have the right amount of motion. Um, sometimes I have to raise my ISO to get a quicker speed. Sometimes I can lower it to get a slower speed. And I try metering in different places around that particular image. I judge a lot of what my black and white and imagery in general on the histogram behind the camera. I can look at the image behind the screen and say, this is getting close to what I want it to be, but I have to rely on the histogram to make sure I'm not blowing out my whites or losing detail on the darks. That's extremely important. Great questions. And to what extent do you use bracketing? I don't. I know. I don't. <laughs> You know, I understand that there is a time and a place for bracketing your images. This may be a time when you're photographing into a very, very bright sun, um, and there is no other way to capture the detail um, unless you are bracketing. 
but I have found, at least with my black and white, especially with the black and white, the art, I want to capture drama. I don't want to balance out all the tonality. A lot of times when we're processing, we are bringing up our shadows and bringing down our highlights to try and balance it out. But I think over time, we've lost this sense of understanding about how important shadows are. Of course, harsh shadows are a little bit different, but shadows help us define our highlights. And that's very important. It helps us give us some depth, dimension, structure, and no matter what it is that we are photographing. So I tend not to do any bracketing. If I am concerned about bracketing, but not stacking in Lightroom and not creating an HDR, I may try a couple of exposures, but that's so I have maybe, you know, minus one stop, minus two stop. So when I get back to the computer, I can choose which, which one to use, but I actually don't merge my images in HDR. And what's the difference between a warming versus neutral polarizer for a black uh, photo? <laughs> well, neutral has no color cast to it, but the warming polarizer, I use a lot in locations like Death Valley, in the woods where warm tones become enhanced. Now, of course, so why do I do it for black and white? Why does it matter? It does matter because I'm actually photographing in raw. So I am able to capture a lot more, uh, a better result if I want to exaggerate a little bit of warmth to my photo. Even though I'm converting it to black and white, I notice a difference. And I will say for my color regular landscape photography, the difference between the two is very noticeable. And I always have both in both sizes because I'm multiple size lenses. Um, if it's something with a warm tone, if it's the running horses in the Camargue, if it's sand dunes, I do tend to use that warming filter and I absolutely love it. And if it's something like water, um, I, I'm gonna use my neutral filter. Excellent. Um, I understand that Nick, NIK, silver effects to convert to black and white actually is not a real black and white. Is there still color in the image? If so, how can I ensure the result is true black and white? Well, that's actually a question I don't know how to answer. I didn't. I don't know that it's not true black and white. Um, that's interesting. I know for a long time it reduced your file size from a 16-bit to an 8-bit, but I believe that they corrected that. Let, let me speak to that again because I strongly believe that the best use for Nick software is to learn the style of photography that you like, but not necessarily apply that preset to your image. So when you have a catalog and you've processed a black and white, or you have one that you want to see in black and white, if you open it in NIC software, uh, SilverFX Pro, you can view that same image as um, high contrast, low contrast, you know, I, I think they have like 20 different filters and you can just run down and see how it changes the look of everything. And that is what I consider a really great teaching tool. I do like to put self-processing in. I encourage photographers, I teach that. Learn what you like from Nick software, but refrain from using it. Try and recreate that sense on your own. Remember that there is a difference between converting a black and white and creating a black and white image. And try and keep that in mind as you're learning from presets what type of style you like. And then we have a couple of infrared questions. I'm going to ask them out of order because um, I think I should. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you have a digital camera converted to infrared um, if so, what company did you use to convert and were there different infrared cho choices to convert to? There are, are two companies that I know of that convert the black and white, and I'm going to have to look up that information, but I think it's always a good idea to get your camera converted. Now, I use the infrared filter. I just put my um, iRay 830 infrared on the front of my lens, and I have my screen set to monochrome and that is how I am photographing 
infrared right now, though I have used an infrared conversion in the past. Um, I don't use that anymore. Somebody else has that camera. I don't think I'm getting it back. But uh, I like putting myself, the artist, behind there a little bit more than I like the conversion. But it's still a great tool for creativity. And I highly stress that. For me, infrared has been a departure, even though I'm a black and white photographer. I still have to, I'm, when I'm looking through the lens, I see things differently. The lights are different, the highlights, shadows. So it makes me think differently. Those are the tools and the toys, so to speak, that allow us to explore our creativity. Because when we can escape work, when we can forget about everything going on around us and get quiet for a little bit, we have these tools like an infrared, like different processing things that allow us to just escape whatever we've become normal and comfortable with. Did that answer the question, I hope? I think so. I actually think you answered three questions in one. So Victor, Gary, and Kim, if that didn't answer <laughs> your question or you have a follow-up question, chime in and let us know. But I think that covered everything. Um, somebody recommended Kalari Visions for infrared. That's it. Conversion. Yeah, Kalari Vision is who I had a great point. Yes, thank you for knowing that. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> um, do polarizing filters work the same in black and white? They actually do. Absolutely. The polarizer, the whole purpose of the polarizer is to work in conjunction with the light. It helps me to enhance contrast when I'm in the field. So it's even more important, I think, for black and white photography because you have no colors to play with. You have just tonality. So having all of that information in your raw file will give you a better raw file to work with as you're creating your image. I use polarizers all the time. And like I had said a little bit ago, I kind of go between the neutral and the warming polarizer, depending on which one I'm using. I also use the waterfall polarizer sometime, Brian Hansen. And then there's a Stingray infused waterfall or infused neutral polarizer that has a little color enhancement to it. So that's a nice thing too, especially for color photography. But any information that you can put in your raw file, whether it's black or white or color, is going to give you a better result. And remember, black and white is just all shades of gray. So we need every bit of data that we can get to help us make smooth transitions in our photography processing. You, you talked about the waterfall polarizer. Can you touch quickly on what does that polarizer do? Yeah, that polarizer is a, it has a two-stop, I believe, a two-stop ND built in with a polarizer. So it's like an all-in-one. When I'm photographing waterfall, especially if it has rocks or anything, you know, in the base of it, those rocks tend to get a shine to them and I don't like it. So that's why I use a polarizer, but it also allows me to slow down the motion of that water even a little bit more because I do have a couple of stops of a neutral density filter all in one. So it's an amazing filter. And do you ever shoot black and white film? If so, do you feel there are differences in the artistic results? You know, I have not really photographed black and white film. Um, I have been thinking about it. <laughs> I can certainly read, study and learn. Um, I have an art, history went to school for art and I I remember when digital came out I wasn't photographing then but um digital came out a lot of photographers were not willing to go to digital and now we've all gone to digital and photography and film is coming back as an artistic style so I'm watching the trend I think it's really amazing if any of us were to go back and explore what photographers did before I will say this I don't think we'll take as many photos <laughs> because we really have to think through absolutely everything that we do. There's not that much film to carry compared to what we're used to with a digital camera. But you'll probably see me out there with the film camera pretty soon, just playing around, seeing what I get. I think it's a good thing to learn. And I think it's a really good thing to somewhat make ourselves a little modest compared to our predecessors where that's all they had they had that and they had um 
they had that and they had a, uh, well, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, my phone just went off. <laughs> so pretty. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head though. I remember <laughs> my film days in college. And like I said, I developed my own film in the dark room. And let uh, me tell you, I put so much thought into every shot because I was uh, limited by that role of film. Exactly. So it, it makes you a much more thoughtful photographer, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's easier to learn with digital, definitely. And that's how I learned. Um, the photographers that I worked at in my previous career, it was all film at that time. Um, but when I finally learned how to use a camera, it was digital. And so I really respect the people that have done it. And it's an art and a craft that is mastered by a handful of amazing people and an art that's kind of gone by, but it looks like it's coming back. So I think that's amazing. Um, let's see, what is your most productive location in terms of black and white? Oh, well, that's actually pretty easy. I have a couple of favorite places. One of them is Death Valley. And I find that the lines of the sand dunes, plus all the, you know, variety of locations out there, it's a very diverse location, National Park. Um, but the sand dunes are very easy. They're sensual. There's lines. Sometimes there's lines and texture in the sand. Sometimes they're clean. But I think that's really beneficial to being able to find the highlights, the shadows, and really be able to work your craft to really get better at seeing and producing your black and white. The other place would be Iceland for me because there are these majestic waterfalls. And then, of course, the Diamond Coast. It's black sand and white ice. It's almost <laughs> perfect as is, but it's also a place where we can play with long exposures, which I love. And a great tip from Nigel, he said to develop your black and white eye, watch old movies and see how they <clears throat> use light and shadow. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Excellent. Yeah, because cinema is so rooted in our artistic vision these days right it's the new it's the main visual art we see it everywhere so looking at how black and white translated um historically in cinema is a, is a great suggestion yeah when do you choose long exposures usually for me it's around water um i'm the kind of person that likes that silky water look to it um, like this waterfall so those are primarily my long exposures and I will go specifically to the Oregon coast and into Iceland to different coastal locations to use long exposures and capture them um, but there are also times where the clouds are so dynamic so if I'm in a mountain range somewhere like Yosemite um, or Norway, where all this dramatic fog or cloud is moving around, peeking out, you know, over top of the mountain, I will use long exposure then as well, because I know that by doing that, the clouds are going to drag across the sky. And if I time it correctly, and sometimes it takes a couple of times, but if I time it correctly, I can get motion as well as line and definition in the clouds that are moving. How do you decide what filters to use and when? And is there one filter that always seems to be on the end of your lens? I don't know if it's just one. <laughs> <laughs> that answers that. Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, I the warming polarizer, I absolutely love. I won't use a grad. I mean, I won't take a photo in unbalanced light without a grad filter. Um, but I really do love my ND filters as well. So I, I'd say it's a combination. I can't say there's one over the other. So how do you choose? Is it based on the location, time of day, weather? Sure. Some of it is based on location, but a lot of it's also based on what I've envisioned. So when I talked about that earlier, I really do try and almost paint a photo in my mind of what I want to achieve. And then I... I look for the drama, I set up my camera, and I say, what tools can I use to be able to achieve that? And that's where my filters come in so handy, as well as understanding your camera, understanding the basic use of your camera and having, you know, a lens that you know is going to do a great job is very important. Um, and trying things that you may not have thought of, I think, are also important to learning this. I became a better photographer with black and white 
when I really understood my camera and didn't have to think about moving anything when I thought, you know, I don't have to think about the exposure triangle or anything else that's already in there. The fundamentals of composition are already embedded. So at this point for me, it's looking for the light, for the drama, highlights and shadows, and then looking in my tool bag and seeing how I can achieve that. And my tool bag includes lenses and, of course, filters. Um, and from Sophia, several of your shots look like they were taken from the air or by drones or from above. How do you get that point of view that you use in several of your photos? Yeah. Well, they are aerial photos for one, and I'm a really bad flyer. So <laughs> I've only done it three times, but I did it twice in Iceland and I did it once in the Everglades. And when I'm doing aerial photography, well, I actually did it three another time because I photographed the volcano hanging out of the helicopter when it erupted in Iceland. But um, I will put two cameras and two lenses on straps, and I have polarizers on them um, as well. And I can't really use a GND filter, but I am shooting down. So typically that's not necessary, but I will go between the two and I will just stick my lens out the window and I will photograph. I need a high speed because we're flying, we're moving. The ground isn't moving, but we are moving pretty quickly up there. Um, so usually I'm at one eight hundredth or one one thousandth of a second. It's not usually sunrise or sunset at all. It's usually, you know, 10, 11 in the morning or even four or five in the afternoon for safety reasons or what I'm able to um, schedule with other companies to get up there. Um, so I keep the polarizer on. I think that's a that's a big help. And then just making sure that you're photographing to infinity. So like ISO 1000, 5.6, and just shoot, high continuous shooting. Some of them turn out really good. Some of them are blurred. Sometimes I catch a wing in the image, but it is a lot of fun once, once I'm okay. <laughs> it's really fun once I land, and then it's like, whoo, I got through it, and now I love it. But <laughs> Fun question and fun activity. I'm going to throw something in the mix here. Um, you talked about listening to Pink Floyd before you shoot. I want in the chat, I want everyone to tell us what band or what song gets you in the mood to shoot while our while we answer this question. Do you visualize and meditate as a basic ritual every time you photograph? Um, do you choose different music depending on the location? Do you choose a certain music to get in a certain mood? That's an excellent question. Yeah, for some reason, Pink Floyd and the Sand Dunes for me go kind of hand in hand. I'm not sure why that started actually, you know, years ago, quite a few years ago. And it was just something that really inspired me. And when I'm on the Sand Dunes, I'm usually by myself um, when I'm photographing. And so it's, I don't know, the music just works with the wind. You know, you if you stand on the sand dunes or in the middle of the dunes, you can hear the wind song and something about the wind song coming through the mountains along with the music of Pink Floyd just really connects with me. So I start thinking and reflecting. But I have a playlist that has all kinds of music. You know, if I feel like being funky, I certainly will put on some good music. I'll put on some Tom Waits if I want to feel a certain mood. It just depends. But I think the important thing is music makes me happy. Music makes most people happy. It makes us stop thinking about all of the busyness that's going on in our brains. And that helps us. That escape really helps us when we're in the moment of photography. So whether it's opera, I listen to all kinds of music. But it's kind of whatever I feel like. I have a big playlist. <laughs> but I encourage you to try everything. I even like a little country. <laughs> Wendy said in the chat, after taking the Death Valley workshop with Jennifer, I started playing music while shooting, including Pink Floyd. So you've had Oh, awesome, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> um, let's see. See, um, someone commented you can use a polarizer with the infrared filter at the same time. Nice. Good tip. Um, how do you manage getting such great clouds in Death Valley? I have never gotten good clouds there. I think, well, some of it I'm sure is luck. Um, but I also stay out there for three weeks every year when I go. And I go between mid-February and mid-March. That seems to be when the storms are hitting the most frequently, not that I haven't occurred them at other times, but that particular 
few week span tends to get a lot more storms. Now, I, we did get rain this year, which was highly unusual. Typically, I don't see the rain, but it kicks up the wind and the clouds move in and out. So it's timing and it's how long I stay. And the fact that I return every year has a lot to do with it too. A couple of folks want to know how to get in touch with you and how to find out about workshops. Oh, let's see. This is my website. So you can look on there. You've got galleries to look through and of course, workshop information. We also do webinars um and creative challenges on a monthly basis for those needing some inspiration and can you explain more about your long lens choice and other lenses you use oh yeah um so my long lens choice it goes between the 70 to 200 and the 1 to 400 um I do use the one to 400 quite a bit because I'm able to isolate so much when I do that. And I like that a great deal. Um, it helps me to isolate the drama. And I think when I can do that, when I see it with my eyes and I zoom in on something at 400 millimeters, I've eliminated all the distractions, right? So now I can really focus and tweak and move something a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right to try and achieve what I wanna do. Um, but sometimes 70 to 200 is enough. And my 70 to 200 millimeter goes to 2.8. So if I want a really shallow depth of field, that becomes the, the lens of choice. And do you use aper aperture priority for your photos in black and white? No, I use manual for everything with the exception of wildlife. I do photograph my wildlife in aperture priority, um, but everything else is manual mode. Do you use any particular apps to form to formulate your exposure? No, but there are a lot of apps out there. Um, I have photo pills on my phone, but I use it for something else. And there are a lot of other apps out there. But no, I don't. I understand all the basics of photography. For me, I am approaching it not from a technical standpoint, but from an artistic standpoint. And that's hard for some of us. You know, a lot of us come from a technical side and it's hard to get in the creative you know, mood. And then for us that are maybe more on the artistic side, the technical is a little more challenging. So I see a lot of people in both those arenas. And then once in a while, you get someone who's, you know, really connected with both. Um, for me, I look at it visually and then I check behind myself to make sure my histogram is good technically, to make sure that everything is sharp based on how I know, you know, to use aperture and time and everything else. So there are apps if, if you want to use those, but I also encourage anyone that's thinking technically minded to just go out once in a while and try it from a creative perspective and see what the results are. And when you get to processing, you'll learn a lot about what to do and what not to do. And I think that's an important part of black and white. And I think last question of the night, maybe not. Um, you mentioned aerial photos. Have you used the drone before? And if so, which drone? I have never used a drone. Um, I'm quite clumsy. I don't think <laughs> that would be wise for me. I'm sure I would crash it on the first take. <laughs> so I can't help you with that one. <laughs> Sorry. I crashed my kids like Toys R Us version. So I feel oh, like did you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, do you print your photos and what model of printer do you use for your black and white? Well, I have an Epson sitting over here in the studio. Um, it's a very, very large Epson. <laughs> I do. I print. Um, I'm also a Moab master photographer, so I do a lot of printing, sell a lot of limited edition prints and fine art prints. Um, so, yeah, but I also have someone I work with um, that actually runs the printer itself. So I will get a lot of testing. I will do a lot of test shots and, and work on that. And, once I approve it, they're ready to roll. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this presentation. Like I said, I thank love you. the storytelling aspect. I just didn't even want to interrupt you as you were going. <laughs> I am inspired. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to take some artistic black and white photos. And I hope our audience will as well. 
Well, I hope so too. And thanks everybody for coming out tonight and sharing photography. I always say creativity spreads. So you got to come and catch it and then share it with your friends. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for Thank joining you. here. Have a great night. You too. Good night.